All right. Um, well, welcome everybody. It's nice to look out here and see some friendly faces um, in Steidl building. And um, do we have anybody online yet? We have Stevie. We have Stevie online. So we're glad we have Stevie online. We may have some others joining us too. Um, you just heard that we are recording. So um, we'd like to put these recordings up on our website so that they're available for other um, people to listen to after the fact. Um, but I think we already did introductions. My name is Emily Baxter, and this is Jane Sutherland, and we are uh, learning designers in the Dutton Institute. And the Food for Thought series um, is a monthly professional development series. This fall, we really focused on academic integrity issues. Um, and so over the last two sessions this fall, we've talked about what those issues might look like. Um, we've heard from the EMS Academic Integrity Committee about how to deal with those types of issues if they do come up in your classroom. Um, and we've talked about some sort of broad brush ideas, um, ideas like question banks, um, things that you can implement in your course to try to mitigate academic integrity issues. Um, but Jane and I were thinking that it would be helpful today to do a session where we could um, go a little deeper and think about what the culture of a classroom looks like, um, where students don't feel, hopefully, so inclined to um, to find the easy way out and find opportunities for cheating. So um, our hope today is that we can kind of look at things um, that you may already be doing in your classroom, um, or and we also have some hopefully grab and grow, grab and go ideas that you can take with you and be able to implement in your classroom um, to really um, cultivate that culture within your your um, your classroom where students don't feel inclined to um, take that easy way out. So um, that's kind of the big picture idea of what we're doing here. Um, we thought that to start things off, we wanted to, this will be, I'll tell you all, a, an interactive session. So we'll hopefully get to know a little bit more about each other as we go through our session today. Um, but to start things off, we really wanted everybody to think about a time when you really felt motivated to do your best work. So you can think back to a time when you were in school yourself, maybe. Maybe there was a particular teacher that you felt was very motivating. Um, but it could be someone that was maybe a coach on a team that you were part of, um, a leader for a club or organization that you were part of. And it doesn't have to be something from your childhood. It can be an experience that's more recent, too. Um, but we're really interested in um, having you think about whoever that leader was, that teacher or that coach, um, and think about some words that might describe that person um, that you found to be particularly motivating. If you think about their leadership style or their teaching style, what was motivating? And we're using this poll everywhere. Um, so we're hoping to put together a little word cloud with um, your um, association. So if you have a laptop with you, I see at least one out there and probably online too, you can go to this URL and you can just type in any words that you think of that might describe that person. Um, if you have a mobile device, you can text um, as you see up here, to put any words in that you think describe um, that person or people, if you can think of multiple people. And we'll take a look here in about a minute to see what responses we have. All right, you can continue to add to this if you would like, but we should be able to see kind of a live um, capture, which maybe isn't, I apologize, a couple of, oh there, that's a better arrangement. Um, very clear what the biggest response there was, encouraging. So um, it looks like a lot of you are thinking of a person or people that really encouraged you in whatever um, it was that you were learning or working on. Um, lots of great words in here. Um, inspiring, helpful, positive, responsive, engaged, um, passionate, engaging. So um, taking a look at all of these words, um, we really want you to, to think about those words um, and how they uh, were part of that relationship you had with that person that you're thinking about. Um, we're going to be talking today about the importance of um, your relationship with your students. Excellent. Okay, I have an activity for you and Stevie, you can uh, participate with this online as well. Yeah, go ahead and um, switch to the next slide. I'm going to pass out uh, I'm going to set my timer and um, I'm going to give you about 45 seconds to look at this list of words and phrases and I just want you to count the number of vowels that you see in this word list. So go ahead and begin. Okay, and stop. Yeah, 
can't get my phone to stop. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so I just want you to um, fold that paper over or turn it over so you can't see the list of words and then, or words and phrases. And then I want you to write down as many of those words and phrases that you can remember. Okay, I've stopped seeing pens right. So how many, um, how many words could you remember? Um, 10, nine, four, five, should I start five? <clears throat> four, three, all right, excellent. Now, <clears throat> why do you think, um, why do you think that is? Why, why did you have trouble remembering those uh, lists of words? Yes, Megan. Because the focus was different. Because I asked you to count vowels and then asked you to do a different kind of task. Okay, so flip the words back over and I'll let you try this again. And this time, um, see if you can find some sort of a pattern um, with that list of words. Read them um, down from the left column to the right column. Oh yeah, thank you, Emily, coming that back. Read down that list, see if you can find some sort of a pattern or organization to the list, okay? And then flip your paper over, and I'll give you the same amount of time and see how many words you can remember this time. Okay, so this time, how many words, were you, words or phrases were you able to remember? More than three, more than five? More than 10, not more than 10. Okay, well, well, again, what was the difference between those two activities? What helped the second time versus the first time? What made a difference? Anybody? Yes. Focus. Because what you need to do, <laughs> right? And um, you're, like, a lot of Well, right. Okay, so that's exactly right. So both of those things were helpful. One, you were clear of the goal. What was the goal of the activity? What was the goal of the um, assignment? What was I trying to focus you into? And then two, helped give you a list of, and this one was pretty basic, I can go back to that. Um, <clears throat> if you didn't find the cycle or find the pattern, I was going in things in order, numerical order. So dollar bills, one, Dice would be two, a tricycle, three, four leaf clover, four, hand, five, you know, to try and help you. And that, um, we're trying to relate the information to something that you were very familiar with to help you remember that. So trying to help students and trying to, um, in an in a activity or a process, um, <clears throat> I can remember back to my English days in high school when this teacher would say, I want you to read chapter, it was Tale of Two Cities, I remember the book explicitly. She would say, read, you know, the chapter, and then the next day we'll discuss. And I was like, and then she'd give us this read, did you read it quiz? And I was like, this is not a did you read it quiz because I read it twice, but I didn't know the answers to any of these questions. So it wasn't a did you read it quiz, it was a did you understand it quiz. And I didn't, I miss like all the subtle nuances of that text because I didn't have good direction or good focus on what I was really trying to read. So these are things in your class trying to help these students figure out the relevance of what, what it is that they're doing in that activity. Is it that I'm just trying to solve these pro problems or is, are I most interested in the procedure that you took to solve the problem? Um, when you're reading a text, what should I be looking for? What should I be um, focusing on in the text. Okay. Okay. One more, uh, well, not really one more, but <laughs> another group activity. This might be a good opportunity for um, us to learn a little bit more about each other too. Um, what we'd like you to do just for um, a, a minute or two here is to think about something that you are good at. It can be something professional, something you do in your personal life. Um, bike riding, knitting, um, playing an instrument, singing, anything that um, is something that you would consider yourself reasonably proficient at. And we'd like you to not only think about that activity, but think a little bit more about that. Think uh, about why you're good at that particular activity. Um, how have you gained that level of proficiency? Did you, you didn't just jump on a bike and ride it for 50 miles the first time you rode a bike. So um, what, what contributed to that um, and what you've done over time to make progress toward that level of mastery? 
Mastery. And we thought giving you an opportunity to kind of talk amongst yourselves. Um, Stevie online, if you want to um, put in the chat anything that you would like to share, and we'll make sure we share that out too. Um, so we'll give you about a minute just to share um, quickly with the people around you if you want to pair up and have a little conversation. So it's good to hear so many good conversations out there. Hopefully you've learned something new about the people who are, are sitting near you. Um, Stevie shared online, hers was um, knitting um, and lots of knitting and YouTube. So in her case, lots of practicing um, and using YouTube videos, observing other people, spending time watching other people doing it. Um, so do we have any other people in the audience here that would like to share out some observations you made um, about how you have become proficient at, at whatever it is you've talked about? Anybody want to share? Practice. Okay. So lots of practice. Anything else? Okay. Okay. So for those online, yeah, Stevie, um, April was talking about baking cookies with her grandmother, and so she was noting that practice was important, but she was also getting feedback from her grandmother as she was practicing that. Don't mix up teaspoons and tablespoons. Don't mix up teaspoons and tablespoons. Good advice. Yeah. Anything else we haven't said already? Any other observations? Instructing. Instruction. Okay. Yes. As Stevie pointed out, she sought instruction from YouTube. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Trying so, to figure out different ways to do things or new doing things. Right. Um, so a lot of common themes there, but what's coming through is that repeated practice, doing something over and over and over again, and also perhaps getting instruction or feedback from other people who are experts who can help. So that's going to lead us into kind of our framework for the next part. Yeah. So, I mean, just finishing up on that rigor, um, example is that, you know, this was something that you're interested in doing. So you were interested in doing the practice. You're interested in, in putting in the hard work. Um, I know Mr. Franklin uh, down the street can get those players to get up at all hours of the morning to do all sorts of weightlifting and exercises and all sorts of rigor that most probably 19, 20 year old gentlemen on campus are not doing, <laughs> you know, because they're, they're interested in, in succeeding. And there's a model that I like. I don't think I made a nice little slide with um, the three R's. And I like to bring in all of these kinds of things into our classrooms, um, into this, this framework really fits. The re relationships, relevance, and rigor. So just in the brief amount of time that we've spent this morning, if you're thinking about positive learning environments for yourself, you identified the things that were really important to you about a good relationship in a class, in a club, in any kind of um, exercise where those people that you were working with cared about you, they provided you feedback, they were um, passionate about what they did, um, they were encouraging to you, again, coming back to that, fab, that feedback. The relevance piece um, was a little bit contrived with my, my instance, but I was trying to come up with um, something to illustrate that when you understand why it is what you're doing, you're a little bit more motivated to do the rigor part, the work part. So those football players are motivated and work really hard because they believe that the coaching staff is going to help them um, win the game. And maybe their aspirations to become a professional football player or maybe just they just want to be very good at what they do. So they're working really hard because they have that, the relationships with the coaches and they know that they're going to be able to, to, to succeed. Um, even if they have experienced failure, maybe like last week's game. <laughs> but, um, but then there's opportunities too to fail and to encourage and to, to um, improve. So as Emily and I were preparing um, for this session and trying to understand why it is that students cheat, right? Because I don't know if we're ever going to be able to completely curb cheating in our classrooms if they're motivated to cheat. 
Um, we can try proctoring, we can try our test picks. There's lots of things we can do to try and prevent that, but ultimately it comes down to the student and whether or not they desire to cheat or not. And in these kinds of environments, if you think about times in your own life or maybe experiences in classes, why do some faculty have less um, cheating than others? You know, what kind of environments are they providing for those students so that cheating is not as desirable um, from the student perspective? So we did a little research, Emily did a lot of research on looking at um, actually what the research says about why students um, want to cheat. And it comes back to these three areas, relationships, relevance, and rigor. So if we look at the relationships piece, um, students were, uh, you know, wrote that faculty that ignored them or didn't understand them, didn't take time to um, stress the importance of academic integrity, they were more likely to cheat. It, they didn't feel, and in an online class, maybe the, they don't feel any presence from the faculty member. They don't really feel it. It doesn't really matter whether I cheat or not. They don't really care. You know, those kinds of things. Um, students were more likely to cheat. Um, uh, they also found uh, that students were easier, it's easier for them to shift the blame as to why they were cheating when they didn't feel connections. Um, with their faculty member. Well, it was, you know, this faculty member's fault that, you know, they left this wide open and you know, uh, this wide I could cheat. So um, not, not having those good relationships. For relevance, and we saw very easily how, you know, you can, you might have been tempted to cheat, um, look back, turn the paper back over and look at the words when you're in a situation where I only have two of these down and my grade depends on this and I want to get to the next level and I need to get at least 10. You may have been tempted to turn, turn that over, but me as an instructor, if I had given you that the second set of instructions first, you experience more success and you wouldn't, might not have felt that need to turn it over because you, you were, we set up the framework better they understood the relevance. So working hard to try and put some sort of understanding and I'm gonna move around the room. It's okay. Okay. Um, putting in that piece of relevance uh, into activities and into your courses will help um, with that. Um, and then going back to the research that uh, some students noted um, more appealing classes um, curbed their cheating, uh, curbed their cheating, really because it was more interesting, and and they understood that it was really important. And so, I mean, we probably experienced that too when we looked at that rigor piece. Why was I mo most more motivated? Because it was something really interesting um, to me. If I was really into music and I really liked it, I'm going to be willing to put in more practice um, for that. Um, also, when students tend to see their assignments as busy work, they didn't really see the relevance of what they were doing. They were more apt to cheat or work with a partner or get answers from somebody else because they really didn't understand that that was really going to help them or help them in the professional um, workplace. Um, and that was another thing that came out too, that even, uh, even though students understood academic integrity violations maybe in the classroom, they didn't actually apply that to how that might influence them into the workplace. Though well, that's just school, um, and it'll be different once I get to the workplace. And so trying to help them make those connections that it really does matter making those connections both places. Um, and then collaboration and interpersonal skills um, was more valued um, if the more we value that, the more students felt less likely to cheat if they knew how it was going to affect people that they got to know in their classrooms as well. And then back to the rigor part, um, that when you are structuring your courses and the main goals of your courses are just test scores and um, high levels of test scores, that students feel that pressure to do really, really well and may be more likely to cheat, whether, whereas if the focus is on the learning and the steps to learning and you've built in things along the way in your classes to help allow students to fail somewhat so that they can um, understand maybe what they need to work on for to, to reach that competency, 
um, then they're less likely to cheat too because they have built experiences and know what they need to learn or what they're not good at, what they need to work on, et cetera. And um, I've been especially interested this fall, we've been having lots of conversations about study techniques by students and what does that look like and how can we build in some of these um, practices into our courses just naturally so the rigor is kind of built in um, as we go along so we might be able to look at some of those things but what do you think that we're doing in our classes now what are you doing and you're planning to do in the spring with your course and what do you see that ties into that that we're we're doing really well now anything for me one thing that I'm thinking about is That, that's it's a class that calls on a lot of students' interests, but it also can be an extremely curated class for students. Being technically smart in the field doesn't necessitate being good at forecasting. It's a search area of mind that to it. And I think it's, I mean, it's difficult to understand. Um, so for me, one of the things that I've examined and I've taken with the instructors about is not necessarily reporting the best forecasters, the best smarts, but instead, more heavily towards those who are learning or examining those who are actually figuring out how the process works and learning from their own mistakes and they feel more engaged on it. So that's one area that I'm leaning towards. Mm -hmm. I also have another area, which is a small class of students who are really interested in what they're doing. So that's kind of, that already gets you past the big part of that hurdle. Right. Right, but helping them understand the difference um, of that forecasting and, and that it's important to make a lot of those mistakes. I think we're even highlighting that. That's a really good point. Any of our folks from Dutton see things going on in classes that are really very good at that? Helping with these three relationships, relevance, and rigor? I, I'll put ahead. in, I think um, we could even think of this at a really basic level. I think that um, the faculty that I work with that are very responsive, um, that's, that's really important, whether resident or online, people who respond, um, not necessarily at three in the morning when a student might, might hope that you would respond, but responding to emails, responding um, when students are reaching out and they're needing some kind of help. Um, I, I see a real positive response from students when, when that kind of response mm -hmm. is in place. And I like to see faculty that set up, um, you know, topics and units for the students. Like, okay, last unit we were looking at this and, and we're carrying this over and this is how it, it relates to what we're going to be moving into and kind of setting up those kinds of frameworks, I think, help um, students to um, get focused on on the concept and then they also see that the faculty member is interested and paying attention to what what's going on in class um, I have a course that a faculty member has matched the course lessons with to sectors in professional life that these students will actually move into. And so they are actually seeing real problems in the class that are in that sector. And then the student's job in the class is to figure out a resolution to some of those things. So um, it's really tying the relevance between what it is they're doing in the class and what's actually happening in the profession. So that seems to be working Absolutely. Was Stevie, were you able to hear that? Um, okay, good. Excellent. Um, Stevie was actually in the chat. She was reminding me um, of another um, faculty that I work with, faculty member that I work with who teaches online. And going back to what I said about responsiveness, um, she, she is extremely responsive, so she responds to emails. Um, she's very proactive, too, in communicating mm -hmm. with her students and make sure that she reaches out to them um, and makes them aware of, of what's happening in the class. Um, so she really works hard to cultivate those relationships. I know she said to me um, in the past, too, when we've been working, that she really does hope to get to know something about each of her students. She likes to provide opportunities for them to be able to share something about themselves. 
um, whether it's related to the um, academic topic or not. Um, so she feels like she can really get at what motivates them and really um, it, it is who they are. Um, I know that she also, as part of that, she likes to know what their interests are and she's very well connected in her professional field. And I know that in some of her courses, she's worked really hard to try to connect um, students with other professionals in that field so mm. that they can, um, they can grow as um, young professionals. That's something that, that's been important to her. And, and she needs to cover all of those things, the relationships, re relevance, and rigor in order to find out what her students are really interested in and, and find ways to help um, nurture that and help them learn. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And typically when, when faculty get frustrated with what's going on in their classroom, if you look at these three R's, something is not as strong as the others. You know, if we're, we're focusing on the rigor piece and, you know, my students just aren't working hard, they're not turning assignments in on time, they're not, you know, looking at the, rel do they see that it's what they're doing is relevant? Do you have good working relationships with them? What can you do to enhance those things? And sometimes that rigor, you know, will come up, um, which kind of helps as well. Um, well, we have some, um, I, I can go through, and we can actually go through each one of these relationships. I have more notes about what we can do, and we've got um, a lot of different ideas for activities if you're interested in what we can do to enhance some of these relationships, relevance, um, and rigor, if you'd like to go down that road as well. And if you've got some ideas, we'd love to hear them up, um, as well. Yeah, as we go through these, it may jog your memory mm -hmm. you think of something that you've done in the past or something you know you do in your courses now or someone else another colleague does and so if you would like to share that that would be great we can add that to our add that to our list and i think in the relationships piece we've covered a lot of, of the things that emily and i jotted down ahead of time but just to try and summarize um again those timely responses to emails and and i would even go one step further is is to even to communicate to students what that expectation is. It doesn't have to be, you know, I'll respond within an hour to, to be communicative, but even to say, I'm gonna be checking emails whenever you like to do that. But if something were to come up, just to communicate to say, hey, I have to go run to a conference, I'm not gonna have availability to email, you know, being that proactive kind of thing. I think students appreciate the fact that you took the time to think of them while you were, you know, going to, to a conference and things. I think they, they um, value that. Um, and there are lots of opportunities to utilize the tools that we have to communicate to students uh, via Canvas, um, even uh, via LionPath. But Canvas has a lot of good tools built in that make it easy for faculty to um, communicate to students through announcements, through email, through discussion forums. Through the grade book. Through the grade book. Through the grade book. Yeah, even if you took time to, uh, let's say a handful of students did not particularly do well on an exam, there's a feature in Canvas that you can message students who, and then you can set the criteria. So let's say message students who scored less than 50%. You could directly send an email to them. It would look like an individual email. You could say, hey, I noticed this didn't, you know, exam was a little bit rough. Here are some suggestions, or I noticed that this area was an area that um, you might need to work on, whether you're willing to work with them or send them to resources or to review the material, um, discuss study tech techniques, those kinds of things. I think students appreci appreciate that. I mean, research on and on and on has shown that feedback is probably the number one identifier uh, for success in a classroom when they know that the teacher is giving them good feedback and cares about whether they're going to do well or not they tend to excel um, from that. And that being said we know that your time is valuable and finite and so <laughs> exactly as, as nice as it would be to send an extensive email to all of your students you know every week or every day um, that's that's not necessarily practical so what's nice about some of these tools in canvas is that they can um, still convey that that message, but on your end, it involves much less much less time, mm -hmm. so that um, you can do that efficiently too. So and we're 
always available at the Dutton Institute too to help um, consult on any any questions that might come I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, and there's different formats too in Canvas that you can convey to students, whether it be via text or you could do a short little introduction video if you don't want to take time to type it all out. There's audio recording that you can quickly just even on an assignment. Um, instead of giving um, typed comments, you can turn on the microphone and say, you know, I really enjoyed the you know, paper. Your research was well researched. I'm not giving very good feedback examples, um, but, <laughs> but get, commenting specifically in person um, with audio instead of, of writing all over it um, can also be, I think students appreciate hearing that voice. And then you also get the tone. Um, with that as well. Our international students um, also appreciate that because sometimes they can under, you know, understand the verbal um, easier if, if it's a new language, if English is not their first language, sometimes it's easier to hear it than to read it as well. Um, let's see, um, making yourself available, um, but again, going back to what Emily said, not needing to overextend yourself so that you're so available. Um, what kind of things did we jot down about relevance that you can build into your courses? Um, building this, um, assessments to the real world, um, more of what um, April was saying. How do we connect that to what it's going to be like in the workplace or into the real experience? I'm thinking about um, a faculty member we're working with right now. So she, a final project for her, cor her course really models something that students would be doing if they were working as a consultant in their field. Um, and so she's even modeling her peer review process on the QAQC process that would be done in a consulting firm. Um, so for students, they're, they're feeling like what they're doing is really very practical and preparing for what they might do when they're, um, when they're finished with the program. So that's just another example to throw in there of making, mm -hmm. making the activities very relevant. Um, there, some people do not like to put collaboration kinds of activities into their course because they feel like collaboration equals cheating. Um, sometimes collaboration does equal cheating, especially if that's not the intent of the assignment. Um, so, you know, if students find that experience, you know, collaborating with other students a valuable one, where can you set up experiences where they can, can collaborate or can you shift the assignment a requirement so that um, collaboration is a part of that. Um, industry is absolutely asking for graduates to be able to collaborate and work on projects and be able to communicate and work with people. So finding ways to incorporate that even on a small level um, into classes can also um, help. I mean, ultimately, if you can teach it, you know, you know the information. So finding ways, even as small as that, having students teach other students in the classroom. Um, I found it especially on very, very tough topics or very complicated um, concepts that sometimes students that have just recently learned that are actually better at teaching that to a newer student because they've just learned it and they can kind of get, bring it from a different perspective um, that other uh, students might not get from an instructor because sometimes you're thinking why can't you get this it's so obvious you know and they're you know it's just kind of a road a roadblock but if they can come at it from a different perspective getting more of that uh, student teaching in um okay and then uh rigor um helping uh students structure their whole time management and this is like i said earlier this is a whole piece on what i've been looking at this fall and that students really are terrible studiers they don't really understand what good studying looks like i went to that um, study smarter not harder session that faculty member from psychology and also from science put on and it was excellent um they really they spent an entire hour helping students set up um, different strategies on how to study. And it's not just about reading the textbook over and over and over because that builds confidence in that you know the material, but um, then when they go to the exam and they don't do well, what I found most interesting is that the research all shows that their confidence is like, okay, well, I'm gonna do better next time. I'm just gonna study harder and then they go and do just as poorly on the following exam. And then they 
do it again and they know I'm going to do better this time and they're not. So they're not changing what they do. They're just doing more of what didn't work. And so helping students, you know, um, come up with different strategies to help uh, with understanding the material better, um, I think is something that that's very fascinating to me and things I want to incorporate more into our class. So what do those kinds of things look like? Yeah, question. That studies. <clears throat> there is a website, uh, learningscientists.org. They, they are, they're social psych, or clinical psychologists, social psych cognitive psychologists, yeah. some sort of psychologist. You know. And their research is all about how, how do people learn. And they've uh, recently been awarded some um, money to help, okay, now that we know and have good ideas about how do people learn, how can we share that? So their audience, I would say, is more K to 12. However, um, I've been let they have a blog um, that you can follow. They have a podcast that's really good. Um, they have all sorts of PowerPoint presentations and PDF handouts that if you were in a class and they recommend so after students don't do so swell on the first exam, they're kind of interested in how they can do better. They're more apt to be willing to listen um, to that. So that's where they, they have been squeezing it into their, their classes. <laughs> is after the first exam and then giving them techniques and they like I said the learning scientists um, dot org has all sorts of presentations um, and tips about um, for students helping them yeah that would be that would be really interesting. And some of the things that it, it just, it's very repetitive to me. Like I'm, I'm coming back just like this relationship relevance rigor thing you'll notice in all the kind of literature, I can always kind of fit it in one of these things that it kind of keeps coming around. But same with the, the learning models, the make it stick, the, um, um, the idea of spaced practice, you know, which seems, um, sort of obvious but we don't see that all too often so what that looks like is um if, if i'm in a resident instruction course and we're doing some um, um lecture material then i might ask the students uh, at the end of the class you know write down three questions that you might have had from today's lesson um there's one say that showed exactly they took the class, divided it into one half of the class just asked the questions. The other um, half of the class did not. Um, they didn't answer the questions. They didn't grade the questions. They didn't um, have other students answer the questions. They just had them ask the questions. And on average, that half of the class did a whole grade letter higher than the, the students that didn't. And why? I think it just it forced them to re kind of think about what was covered in class and to come up and formulate questions um, for themselves and, and help build structure into their um, heads about that. Another idea along those lines that they talked about was um, this retrieval practice. So I know it's hard when you're lecturing and you have so much that you know you need to cover during the course of the lecture and you feel that pressure. Um, but it can be very helpful, and again, research has shown this, that if you can even pause, you know, every 10 or 15 minutes during your lecture, just to give students a chance to even turn to the people next to them, maybe compare notes. Um, again, the um, learning scientists in the presentation we attended, they reiterated that the, the research shows just handing students a, your slides or handing them a printed out set of notes is not valuable. What is valuable is giving them a framework that they can fill in. So if you've already sort of organized those topics in a way that you know makes sense, the way they go together, and then as students are listening to you lecture, they can fill in that important information. But if you pause during your lecture and give them time to compare notes, to talk about any questions that might have come up, um, that, that is also very, very helpful. And again, the idea is um, they talked along these same lines with retrieval practice that um, you want to avoid students cramming. So studies show that students who cram right before an exam, initially they may score higher than students who were not cramming. But when you look at long term and you 
evaluate those students further out, the students that weren't cramming and had taken time to um, go over the, um, the material at different intervals, those are the students that are going to retain that information mm -hmm. better. So when you can incorporate that into your lecture, when you can maybe go back um, in a lecture and revisit material that you had discussed maybe a couple of lectures prior, that's another good way to have students um, be able to retrieve that information. And ultimately, it will help that them retain that, which I know we've talked to so many professors who do feel frustrated when they get a group of students and they say, oh, they've already been through this course. How can they not remember this material? So that's a comment that comes up very frequently. Um, and incorporating these types of ideas, you know, research has shown that really does help students retain that information long term um, and not just learn it for that exam and then have it disappear. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you can, um, the question was, you know, how do you um, um, make time to not just compartmentalize, I'd say, if, if you can somehow figure out how to cycle back to things or bring up how they relate in future lessons and, or try and do part of, um, she had given the, the idea of start a topic, stop, start a new topic, come back to the first topic because then it's harder, right? Because you have to go back and pick up where you left off. It's forcing you to think through, okay, where was I? What did I have to do? Where, how did this go together? It, it helps make it, it stick as well. Um, and so trying to do some of that or um, compartmentalizing topics and then maybe three times later, let's just um, see how well you can remember from memory what we talked about, you know, from or solving this problem or remember this concept or that kind of thing um, later. She really stressed about trying to have people remember from memory. Um, this is something that I, I would, as a student, go back and rewrite my notes. Um, and there, she said that's a good idea, but you shouldn't do it right after class. You should maybe do it the next day. To because you're trying to remember from memory what happened and what was being said. And that's where it's nice that if you have compared notes with somebody, the gaps that you have filled in or have opportunities to start class with, you know, what was missing from your notes or some sort of clicker type question or questioning um, ahead of time. And she even gave the example of putting in practice tests that are very worth very minimal, um, which I would say, well, how do you have time to do that? <laughs> you know, but um, even the practice exam, she said that trying uh, could be very similar form or very similar questions than your actual quizzes, but maybe in a different format. So maybe it's multiple choice for your um, for your practice quiz, but they're open ended answers for the exam, or you know. Maybe it's flip flopped, but that didn't seem to, you know, they could be exactly the same questions, just formatted differently. Two other things I know that um, using, Jane just mentioned clickers, having some type of poll question, like we even just did this poll everywhere at the beginning of our session. Um, that's free, it's very easy to set up. Um, and you can do that right in, in class. The clickers, I know there are a lot of uh, professors who would use that. Um, I know when we attended this session um, at the Schreier Institute, we were um, as low tech as holding up pieces of paper with A, B, C, or D. So you don't even need to incorporate the technology. You can ask students a question and they can just you know, show you their answer that way. And I know that um, mm -hmm. the presenter used that quite a bit during the session to get a real gauge on um, what was happening in the room, what people were understanding or not understanding as she was talking. Um, so that can be something that's quick to put into your course. Um, another suggestion that um, has come up in research that's very helpful too is to delay assessment. Mm -hmm. So you may have, um, if you're teaching online and you have a lesson that students are, are in, in this particular week or you're lecturing on this topic this week, not having that assessment immediately follow that lecture or that online lesson, but delay that so that students are, are hearing or reading that lesson content initially, but then they'll be going back and returning to it later in order to prepare for whatever the assessment is. So that's another way to kind of build in without maybe Just, taking as much time out of your, um, your lecturing time um, to uh, build
build in that spaced practice. Mm -hmm. So that's another yeah. thought. Trying to build in more of these mega cognitive kind of um, practices with reflection. You know, how, how is this content related to what I'm doing in the previous class or what I'm going to be doing in the future or what I do at home? When I was in the College of Nursing, we had them constantly relating this new content to different patients or the uncle with this ailment or that, you know, trying to relate it and share those experiences not following HIPAA, of course, but, um, but ha it allowed for students too, when you can relate it to a story or an event or a process, it also helps students remember them. And, and then I could say, oh yeah, Emily had an instance where, you know, this and this and this happened, or um, it'll help make those connections, help put it in kind of an order for them. And so providing opportunities for students to do that or ask them to do that, um, how did today's, you know, lecture relate to this and it helped them trying to build the connections um, um, that way. Um, having them structure the lecture in a different way, that was uh, something I thought was interesting too, like taking what the content that you had and building a concept map or a table or a chart or, or drawings, you know, trying to convert it into something else will also force students it, um, to remember it. Um, better or think about it differently. It's making me think questions. actually about sketch noting, right? So that's a really popular concept right now. People who are in, you know, attending conferences and and sketching their notes on, you know, what they're they're listening to. And I, it's just, I'm just talking off the cuff here, but I'm wondering if there's any research into oh, yeah. um, people utilizing that because that would be an interesting way of um, students um, representing their learning in another in another way. Um, mm -hmm. And that. That would seem like something that could be fun to see if anybody would want to sketch note your lecture. Um, but that idea of just you know thinking about that information that you're conveying and representing it in a, in a different way. And those kinds of ideas are what that learningsciences.org. They have lots of concrete examples, and um, then the, the course, the research that all backs that up as well. Um, but we're we're I and I know Emily is too. We're really interested to hear how things actually work. You know, how it works for you. Like the research says this and these people are saying this, but if you try these things out in classes and, and it either works really well, we want to hear about it. Or if it doesn't work well, I want to hear about those things too, because I want to understand, you know, what our students are, are looking for and how we can help them. I mean, clearly they're paying a lot of money to come here. How can we help them feel like when they graduate, they not only have gotten a good value for their money, but that they have gotten those skills and can take it out into the workforce and you know be successful and not feel like college was just a, a piece of paper. You know, and then the, now the real, the, learn, the learning really begins. You know, I want to kind of shift that kind of idea, um, especially as higher ed um, struggles to, to retain students and to show the value for how expensive it is. We want to try and make it as valuable experience as we possibly um, can. Anybody have anything they'd like to, questions or follow up? Because I think we're just, yeah, we're just about out of time. Anything? Well, we will make the recording available if there's something that you want to go back and um, revisit. Um, we'll have that. We also um, have other resources and things online. Um, if you're interested, we can send those out as well. But thank you very much for coming. And we will not be meeting in December, but we will be coming back in January. Um, we're thinking about working on some undergraduate education topics, yeah. correct? Yeah. So that's still a work in progress, but that's what we're coming back to. So thank you for coming. Did I have, oh, we do, and we also have a bunch of resources from today too. If you're really interested in look, diving deeper into the actual research, um, we can share that with you as well.